Welcome. Uh, today, what we're going to be looking at is our second lesson on the aggregate demand and aggregate supply lesson. In particular, we're going to look at how those curves, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, can change, uh, what factors cause those curves to change, uh, and then what the impact ends up being on the resulting equilibrium within your economy. Uh, just to review, yesterday we learned a little bit about ADAS, and we learned that it's a tool uh, that is used to visualize and model where an economy may be performing at a particular point in time. Uh, just as you saw with supply and demand in microeconomics, uh, the ADAS model is not static. Uh, we looked at three static positions yesterday in terms of what we call the recessionary gap, um, the ideal sort of full employment scenario, and then finally uh, a, a position where you may have overgrowth, uh, a little bit of a bubble or what we call an inflationary gap. Um, those scenarios can all emerge at different points in time. The reason, of course, you may not be uh, where you want to be is that both aggregate demand and aggregate supply, um, even when you get them into an ideal spot, they move. And so what we're going to be looking at a little bit today is why is it that in a real dynamic world those factors do move? what causes them to move, and then ultimately what are the policy implications of uh, that information. Um, first thing we're going to be looking at a little bit is aggregate demand. Uh, and to be totally and completely honest, um, analyzing how aggregate demand moves and what that means for your economy is generally pretty straightforward at a theoretical level. Uh, you'll recall that aggregate demand corresponds with the GDP, uh, those things that tend to create desire for spending, whether it's people's consumption, people's investment as businesses, um, government spending or exports coming into the country, um, they all contribute to a higher GDP. And so when the forces that work on those things are growing and there's more demand for spending, you'll generally see that the aggregate demand curve will grow with uh, sort of a corresponding uh, factor. Uh, similarly, if you look at those factors and you move them in reverse, so let's say, for example, consumer spending decreases, then you'll tend to see that that will actually push the AD curve uh, in the other direction. Uh, so again, just to reiterate, and you can see this here on the screen, um, since GDP is equal to those different factors, any one of those different factors or the summation of those factors, any one of those factors changing will have a consequent impact on aggregate demand. And generally speaking, the goal for an economy is to move the aggregate demand curve in most situations, barring uh, overgrowth to the right, trying to get more GDP created through spending. Um, sometimes things may force it in the leftward direction, though, and oftentimes, well, not always, but often that can be a little bit of a negative. Um, here you can see a picture which shows you a little bit of how this works. Uh, you'll notice that when we're looking at our aggregate demand curve, it's our straight line downward sloping. This would be a particular period of time. Uh, if we were to have something happen that caused for more spending to occur, and you'll see that there, any one of those factors could lead to that, then if consumption goes up or investment goes up or government spending goes up or even exports go up, the consequent impact is just like an increase in demand in the supply type, uh, supply and demand type micro model, uh, the aggregate demand curve will push to the rightwards and you'll have a higher level of spending uh, than you had before. Uh, similarly, if you're going to be looking at a decrease, uh, which can also occur, you're looking at the opposite movement. Uh, and again, what's happening in this particular instance, even though I didn't put the equation on the board, is that usually one of those factors that leads to a level of GDP uh, has declined, whether it be consumption or investment or exports or one of those things. Uh, and the decline has been substantial enough that if there's enough of that, and it doesn't really sort of get counteracted by any growth, then you may actually see the aggregate demand curve pushing this direction. Um, there's a number of different things. We can look at all of these different factors individually. Um, but again, I think for the most part, the theory hopefully is fairly straightforward. Um, we'll start with, and I'm just going to go through these one by one, personal consumption. Um, that's probably the biggest factor that does tend to lead to movement of your aggregate demand curve. Uh, just because GDP is, as we've seen, over 50% comprised of consumer spending. And so it's natural that that consumer spending will um, make a difference in terms of the positioning of your AD curve at any one point in time. Um, if you have a consumption increase, then it will push to the right. That can happen for a number of different reasons. Uh, firstly, you may have a situation where people's incomes rise. Uh, there's a good economy, people get more money. Um, typically, the more money you have, especially when you're in a situation where you don't have tons of money, um, you're going to use a lot of it. 
And so oftentimes there's a benefit to actually um, uh, having those income rises because they grow the economy as well. Um, personal income taxes can fall. That can also give you more money. Um, a little bit harder to increase spending with that particular tool because, again, it really depends on who's getting the tax decrease and what they do with their money. Um, one of the dilemmas with tax increases at times is that if you give a tax decrease to a person who maybe doesn't need to spend money, then there's no guarantee that they actually do. They, they could bankroll the money and just put it in a, a sort of uh, security of some form. Um, and oftentimes the money may not really move through the economy that quickly simply because the spending levels are not so high. Uh, whereas if you were to give a tax decrease to a person um, who was, let's say, for example, not necessarily of very low means because often they don't have a lot of tax, but rather to a person sort of middle income, um, those people probably have a lot of bills. They probably have a lot of things that they need. Um, and generally speaking, the less money that they're actually paying out towards taxes, the more that they will push it. Okay, and so that will definitely be an impact there in terms of positively increasing aggregate demand. Um, if you have a situation where borrowing becomes easier, then people will also spend. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more when we talk about monetary policy and a little bit more when we talk about investment. But obviously, interest rates are a big part of that picture. Uh, when you have kind of a shaky economy and maybe aggregate demand is lower than you want it to be, certainly one of the tools that the government often will use in correspondence with uh, or in correlation with the Bank of Canada is they may actually work towards getting interest lower and freeing up people to spend more money because, again, um, lower interest will encourage more uh, consumption. Now, the danger, of course, is that it also encourages um, a buildup of debt, which can have a long run crowding out effect uh, if it becomes a crippling um, sort of dangerous variable. But hopefully government is smart enough to realize that they don't want too, too much spending. They want to make sure that whatever people are buying, they can actually afford. Um, the last factor would, of course, be if people uh, decide to save less uh, and, and decide to just put more money into the market. Again, there's various factors that can cause that to occur, but it usually does lead to positive growth in terms of aggregate demand. Um, the last question here, which I've already kind of addressed with our discussions, how might the government use this to its information? Well, you can probably guess a little bit at government policy. We're in a position where aggregate demand, unfortunately, will be lower than we want it to be over the six or seven months to come, potentially a lot longer than that. Um, I think there's an inevitable recession. You'll want people to spend money. And so how could you encourage them to spend money? Well, lots of ways. Maybe give them a little bit of a boost in terms of not charging quite as much for their taxes, especially at the lower ends where you know that money is going to go into the economy. Um, maybe you might want to uh, find ways of getting job creation or maybe actually sort of giving stimulus, giving money to people to try to get the money moving. Uh, there was an interesting suggestion today in the news from um, former uh, Republican presidential nominee from a few years back, Mitt Romney. Um, he'd said that his idea for getting the economy moving is to give everybody in the United States a thousand dollars. Well, I mean, the danger of that, of course, is if you give everybody in the United States a thousand dollars, somewhere down the line, the United States has to pay for every citizen getting a thousand dollars. And that's not inexpensive. That's a, that's an enormous cost. Um, the, the flip end, though, and I think this is the economic argument, is that if you give people who are in need $1,000, they'll put that money into the economy because they're probably nervous and they probably feel like they've got bills and, okay, well, they might as well use it. Um, and then, again, that will get economy sort of moving, but it will also push the aggregate demand in the direction you want it to go. And hopefully it will start to push itself afterwards. Uh, the, the general philosophy there is what we call stimulus, and certainly it's something that obviously can be done through government policy, even if that government policy is just a transfer of funds to get consumption going going. A rare sort of policy, but certainly one that's possible. Um, any of those things that we just talked about there, uh, if you were to reverse those factors, would lead to a decrease in aggregate demand. Um, again, I think it's fairly straightforward how that would occur. If you wanted to get aggregate demand lower, um, you would want to have consumers spending less money. Or maybe if interest rates rose, again, they'd be discouraged from spending money. They may slow their uh, consumption patterns. Uh, sometimes it may be a deliberate uh, effort of government to try to push spending that direction. Things like interest rates going up, it may well be part of the factor uh, or part part of the plan. Um, in most situations, though, a decline in aggregate demand, unless you have a hyper 
sort of growth period in your economy, it's probably not ideal. It's usually occurring because of the fact that your economy is suffering from some kind of external pressures or some kind of internal collapse where it's just not doing well. Confidence is low. Uh, job losses may be mounting and people just cannot afford to spend money uh, the way they were. Um, our current situation right now is certainly reflective of this. Um, of course, it's been an emergency, but you can imagine uh, with people not going to movie theaters, with people not taking flights, with people um, not spending quite as much as they might have because of the fact they're nervous about the future, um, there's going to be a pretty substantial pullback of aggregate demand and a huge portion of that pullback will be due to declining consumer spending uh, within the economy, probably the biggest factor of all. Uh, the second factor that leads to changes in aggregate demand is changes in investment. Um, investment, I guess, uh, not I guess, of course, is the uh, sort of purview of business. Uh, when you have changes in investment, they obviously make a big difference. Uh, more investment tends to shift aggregate demand to the right, so this direction, you can see with my cursor here, um, less investment tends to shift aggregate demand to the left. Uh, governments can't tell private businesses what to do. So oftentimes investment will move in one or the other direction simply on its own, um, but they can try to counteract forces that may be at work by maybe pushing or encouraging uh, businesses to spend more or less money than they may have already been, in uh, I guess, planning. Uh, one of the options which we mentioned of consumption, but even more so applies to businesses that the Bank of Canada may try to do things like lower interest. Uh, you'll notice that the Federal Reserve in the United States, uh, the Bank of Canada here, uh, they've recently really, really reduced their interest rates far quicker than I think anybody was anticipating uh, over the next six months. And a lot of that is just because they know they're dealing with an emergency uh, and they're hoping that, you know, it, while it may not it certainly won't stop the problems and nobody's naive. Uh, it will at least hopefully slow down some of that pullback of uh, investment and maybe cause it to not fall quite as much and eventually pick back up a little bit as things get better. Uh, I would anticipate that low interest rates will be a thing for at least about a year. It's still very early to speculate, but you know, even if the sort of virus issue subsides within three or four months, which hopefully it does, there's going to be a sort of long-term domino effect in terms of the lost income and lost money from this particular period. And there's going to definitely be um, kind of a shaky sort of return, I guess, um, to normal, which will require a lot of support from the bank. Um, providing subsidies is another thing that, of course, government can do. So if it doesn't want to rely on the bank, it can sort of give its own money. Um, oftentimes it may do that in areas where there's businesses that in particular they want to see successful. Um, and again, that can lead to growth of aggregate demand through investment that way. Um, and then finally, um, there may be sort of incentives. And so you might see things like, for example, um, a government giving cheaper taxes in terms of, I don't know, property tax, where they may give other kinds of uh, perks. Uh, maybe not necessarily changing all of their policy, but rolling out enough of a red carpet so that that company comes in or puts more money into the economy than it might have otherwise. Um, government spending is, of course, the third major factor in the GDP equation, and it's a huge factor in terms of how you manipulate and cause aggregate demand to sort of move in a direction you might want it to. Um, obviously, government has complete control over that factor, uh, and predictably, you can expect how government spending might work. Uh, if you increase government spending, then you'll increase aggregate demand. If you decrease in the government spending, then aggregate demand will decrease. The uh, question I've put on the screen here is if the government can boost aggregate demand easily by spending more money, which is fiscal policy, uh, and we're going to get into that next lesson, why don't governments always do that? What's the risk? Well, I'll let you think about that for a second. Okay, uh, you can probably guess there were a few risks. Um, one of the factors is, do you want your government controlling all spending within your economy? Um, do you want the government to become so large that they become one of the main players, given the sort of political dimensions that uh, government is often driven by, particularly the need to get elected on four-year cycles that may not conform so well uh, with the actual practical needs of the economy in the long term. Uh, the other issue which you have, which is a huge one for government spending, is that oftentimes when you need government spending the most, uh, there are circumstances where the revenue sources for the government are at, a, are at their lowest. Uh, and so when you have lower revenue, you have lower taxes, you have lower actual money coming in, uh, and of course, less money coming in 
and potentially because there's a stress for this more money going out the end of that is on an annual basis uh, or the end result on an annual basis is a recession sorry a, a deficit uh, and then if you accumulate those deficits over the long term uh, then they start to become your national debt uh, if you look at Canada over the years you'll notice that that was a huge problem as the welfare state started to build up in the years after World War II um, people got pretty used to in the 1950s and 1960s having government pay for a lot of services be they health care um, or sort of improvements in terms of benefits for workers unemployment insurance programs things along those lines uh, the challenge though is that while the 50s and 60s were pretty much golden age years in the economy you had a booming um, consumer market due to the baby boom you had not really a lot of international competition and pretty much a lot of good peaceful sort of situations worldwide uh, when things like the oil crisis hit in the 1970s and more international competition started to emerge uh, it became harder for the economy uh, and the government to pay for those things because Canada's growth started to slow. Um, the costs actually continued to rise as people expected more and more. And the end result was that by the time you got to the 1970s and especially into the 1980s, um, we had a rapidly increasing debt. Uh, when I was a child in the 1990s, the government realized that this growing debt was a concern. Um, there were a number of efforts made to sort of cut back and I guess try to balance the books a little bit more. Um, that definitely helped, okay, and certainly put Canada's um, debt in a p position where it was easier to manage. But there still is a question in terms of have we really gotten the debt down to a level that's um, good for the long term? Um, and are we being careful enough when we have good times in terms of paying that debt down so that we're not crowded out in the future in moments like right now where you may need to spend money and that money may not have been accumulated or the room to spend that money may not be quite there. Um, you'll see here there's this sort of the growth in the debt. Um, certainly there has been a ratcheting up of spending over the last I would say six or seven years. Some of that was actually 10 years or so. Some of that was due to a recession. Okay, you'll notice that when Mr. Harper and the Conservative government came into power, they're actually reducing spending. 2008, 2009, there was a major recession. And I don't think anybody would disagree with this. There was a need for spending. But then when you got into the period of the last few years of their government, they didn't really get the government spending down. And of course, over the last five years or so, you've had a government more inclined to spend money. Um, one of the questions of course is that given that those were pretty good years is that a good move or should we have actually been a little bit more cautious taking down the debt some more so that when an emergency arises lo and behold we have one today uh you would have a little bit more wiggle room in terms of adding true debt but not necessarily adding to a problem that was already there um to give the federal government uh at least a little bit of credit they would argue that while the net overall debt has increased over time. Um, you do have to factor in inflation. $563 million in the 1970s is not the same as 700 uh, in 2020, and that, that's true. Um, and in fact, if you look at the actual debt to GDP, which is the debt compared to the GDP of the country, which is perhaps a more relevant picture because it kind of takes into account inflation, uh, you will notice that we haven't really increased that level too much. So government spending in a general sense has increased, but in terms of the GDP, uh, debt to GDP ratio, um, the current government has maintained pretty sort of standard or, or, or steady rate there, um, which again, uh, at least speaks towards some fiscal responsibility. A uh, couple of final factors for changing aggregate demand, of course, relate to trade. Um, most of this, I think, is fairly straightforward, so I'm going to talk about very quickly. Uh, just like uh, consumption, investment, or government spending, if your exports rise because they're part of that equation, you will tend to increase your aggregate demand. Other than negotiating good deals with countries in terms of things like NAFTA, uh, the government can't directly control the level of exports, um, but certainly the more you can do to actually get trade to become something that's popular with other countries and something that they want to pursue, uh, and the more you can sort of pave the road for the, that kind of trade, um, obviously the better uh, the impact will be on your aggregate demand picture. And again, of course, um, things that will actually encourage money to come into your country tend to be more more beneficial than things that will cause you to require goods from other countries, which may actually pull back your uh, overall level of demand uh, somewhat.
Okay, and so there you can see there's a picture of just how aggregate demand increases and what increases aggregate demand, and then there's a picture of what tends to decrease it. Um, one thing I should note, and we're going to look at this a lot over the next couple of uh, weeks and months, um, when you're talking about government policy, the vast majority of government policy tends to deal with trying to move the curve uh, one of these two directions, typically this direction. Um, that usually relies upon the government trying to either through its own spending, which you can see here, or indirectly through trying to manipulate some of these other kinds of spending. Um, it involves a number of different policy tools. And we'll look at how those work in terms of fiscal policy in the next couple of lessons. And then over the month of April, we'll look a little bit more at uh, monetary policy and the role of the banks. Um, you can also see your economy move if you see changes in the aggregate supply curve. Uh, and so we're going to look at those next. Um, it is worth noting that aggregate supply curves tend to be much slower and much grad more gradual. That's fairly logical. Uh, you're looking at changes in the capacity and the ability of your economy to produce. That typically, it doesn't happen overnight. It tends to happen over a much, much longer time period. But it is still important. Um, it is something that obviously um, a country's government does want to monitor and try to push in a sort of ideal direction. Um, there's three major reasons uh, that we're going to look at for why aggregate supply curves may, mo may move. Uh, the first one, involves changes in input prices. So things that you use to make products with, whether it's labor, whether it's capital, whether it's materials, um, if you change the price of making products, then it has an impact in terms of how much you can make in price levels within your economy. Um, the other two factors that we'll talk about have to do with just the amount of inputs. And so if you increase the amount of labor, capital materials, of course, that tends to create more supply and more capacity. Um, and then finally, we'll look at the impact of technology and efficiency. And that's kind of a, a magic bullet policy if government can actually find ways of, of growing it. Um, the more technology and efficiency you have, the better sort of productivity, the more your aggregate supply curve will push outwards and the more options you have within your economy. Um, the first factor that we'll look at today is changes in input prices. Uh, these involve things, as I mentioned, that you will use to make products with. And if they change in price, usually due to external worldwide factors, uh, then you will tend to see a change in aggregate supply. Um, if the prices go upwards, then it tends to have a negative impact on aggregate supply. And in particular, it tends to lead to higher average level of prices. Um, however, if things decrease in price, um, then at least in terms of the ability of your economy to produce, um, it will generally have a positive benefit because it makes production cheaper and it gives you a little bit better opportunity to produce as a result of that. Um, because changes, now this is an important factor, because changes in input prices do not change the overall amount of inputs in your economy, you will see that they don't change the, the hard cap of what you can do. Okay, that part of your aggregate supply will never move, but they will tend to move those areas where there is a little bit of room for growth, and they'll tend to move it either upwards or downwards depending on what's happening. Um, if you have an increase in input prices, it actually tends to be a drain on your economy. And so as you'll see here, and I'll move in the next graph, what it will tend to do to the aggregate supply curve is that. Uh, you'll notice two things. First of all, production becomes harder and more expensive at levels of production that are possible within your economy. Um, and so there is a negative impact there. But in terms of the maximum, it doesn't really change the maximum ability of your economy to produce because essentially you have the same number of things and they're working the same way they did before. And so your limits don't change, but the aggregate supply curve in terms of its positioning, it does move backwards and it does move a little bit up because of the higher inflation. And that's natural. Prices going up will tend to lead to more inflation within your economy. Um, the opposite, and that just sort of mentions the idea that capacity isn't changing. Um, the opposite is true for a decrease in prices. Um, typically speaking, at least from a supply perspective, things like oil or things like workers being cheaper, um, it actually tends to grow the ability of what you can do in your economy because price levels are lower um, and there's a little bit more room for production. Um, and so when you have that sort of change, you're going to see the aggregate supply curve moving this way. Um, again, the cap doesn't change because the amount of things you have in their efficiency isn't any different, but because of the fact they're cheaper, there's more opportunities to produce when you are under the cap. Uh, when you're looking at things like, for example, the amount of inputs changing, that will actually cause for um, let's say you have more resources, it will cause for a changing aggregate uh, supply curve. And in this case, with more resources, it will increase the overall aggregate supplier capacity of your economy. 
The key thing, though, is that if the amount of resources rises, you're also going to move your sort of uh, far, um, I guess, horizontal portion of the curve because the capital limit of what your economy can do with more stuff is obviously higher. OK, and so in this particular picture, uh, you can see how that works. If you increase the amount of, let's say, for example, workers or the amount of uh, materials you have in your economy, then not only will prices tend to fall because they're more abundant things, um, but you'll also tend to see that you have more capacity overall. Okay? And so it looks like the same thing you saw with the price changes, but rather than just moving the curve downwards, you're also in this particular case moving it outwards because at all points you have more ability to produce and your limit has actually increased. Uh, if by whatever you know, um, negative sort of factor aggregate supply fell, then this would be the consequence. Um, this is less common because typically over time an economy will tend to grow. It's rare that the capacity of economy will decrease, um, but it's certainly possible in a number of circumstances. Um, one example I'll give you would be um, the former Soviet Union, then eventually becoming Russia. Um, especially over the last 20 years, they've had a number of points where uh, as their economy transitioned, uh, they had a decline um, in technology. Uh, they had um, a loss of uh, a workforce. Population has actually decreased over the years. Um, and they had um, a certain lack of, um, I guess, access to some of the resources they had because of the decline technology used to harvest some of those things. Uh, and the end result was that at least for some periods, they actually have, uh, particularly if oil is not doing well, because that's really the one thing that has grown a lot in the Soviet Union, or I should say Russia over the years, uh, is that the aggregate supply curve has actually moved backwards. Okay, and you've actually seen a shrinking of the economy uh, at various points uh, in time. Um, the last factor I want to talk about is productivity. Productivity is kind of the same thing as what you saw with number of factors. Um, sometimes if you have an economy and you don't change the amount of stuff you have, but you change the technologies you have so that you can get more out of the workers or the materials or whatever that you're using, then it will have the same impact that you might see uh, in terms of actually increasing their numbers. And so when you increase technology um, or have some kind of productivity boost, then that will also cause aggregate supply to shift outwards. Uh, and again, if, if you somehow lost productivity, the reverse would be true. We can see that with the graph that we looked at before. Um, this says inputs, but if you're gonna talk about more productivity, the same would be true. Better productivity, better knowledge of how to use your resources, more efficiency with how you do that. Um, it's basically the same as having more of them. And so the more you can find ways of increasing your productive uh, efficiency, the better things will tend to be for your economy. Um, and again, if you can't get things to increase, increase or, or improve, uh, the reverse may be true. Uh, the reverse, again, it's happened in the past. Um, probably one of the most famous examples, maybe a little bit politically controversial, um, but shouldn't be. Um, in the 1950s, uh, China had a communist revolution. And in the early 1960s, in the early period of uh, Chairman Mao's reign, uh, he had what was called the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and essentially, the argument behind the Cultural Revolution was that they were going to move back to being more of an agrarian state run by the people. Well, the dilemma with that, at least for those years in the 70s, uh, was that in becoming more agrarian and sort of shunning technology, they actually made themselves worse in terms of their productive ability within the economy. Um, and for a good 10 years or so, the actual economy within the country that hadn't really done so well for a number of years, it actually shrunk. Um, now, that hasn't been the case for many years in China, but part of the reason for that was that in the late 1970s, there was a new leader who came into power named Deng Xiaoping, um, and his policy had been let's sort of move backwards and actually, uh, or, or move forwards rather, and push for renewal and modernization and a little bit more of an embracing of things like technology and, and investment. Um, and with that, um, you sort of saw a rise of uh, an economy that really hadn't been performing nearly to its full potential. Um, the final factor that I want to mention for the lesson here, and it's getting a little long too, so I'll do it quickly. Um, Typically, when you're trying to move your economy to a higher position in terms of GDP, the general goal is to try to push aggregate demand because it's faster and it's easier. Um, there have been people over the years, though, who've argued that, well, if you can have policies that actually increase your supply, then it's the best of all worlds. Um, one of the most famous of those arguments came about in the 1980s from the Chicago School of Economists, um, led by people like Milton Friedman and some of his um, sort of uh, key supporters, like Ronald Reagan, who was the president of the United States at the 
time. Um, the argument that they'd have is that if you did things like, let's say, for example, reducing taxes on businesses and wealthy individuals, they would invest that money that investment would build up the productive capacity of the economy and in doing so it would actually increase or push outwards the aggregate supply curve and that would lead to a permanent state of growth and a permanent um, improvement in the economy for all people. Uh, it called supply side because the idea is that you're pushing on the aggregate supply curve. The reality uh, is that I think most economists today would argue, did those policies work? Maybe, but probably not as uh, effectively or quickly as, as one would, uh, at least in theory, believe. Um, trying to move aggregate supplies is a noble policy. Uh, the challenge, and I think this was one that the politicians of the day didn't always acknowledge, uh, is that when you're trying to push the aggregate supply curve, it's like pushing on a continent. It doesn't just move in, in, in a matter of a year or two, it, it takes 20, 30 years. And so while some of those investments and some of that sort of money probably was helpful, uh, assuming it actually did go into an investment, which is another question, the challenge is that it wasn't going to lead to a short run boom. Um, that would probably have been foolish to sort of suggest so. Okay? And so certainly um, the legacy of supply side economics, even though it's still popular for a lot of people, particularly you have a little bit more of a laissez-faire perspective um, on how an economy should work. Um, its legacy is at best probably uh, a mixed one. All right, so now that you know a little bit about aggregate demand and aggregate supply and how those curves uh, change, um, you're going to have a little bit of homework. Okay, and essentially your homework is going to be looking at how if you started in a position where your economy was in full employment, so you can see this in this graph here, where you have an economy in full employment, and something happens to either move your aggregate demand like you've seen in this picture, or perhaps to move the aggregate supply curve as well. Um, how will that change the overall level of performance within the economy? Um, what will be the resulting, um, I, I guess, state of affairs? And so if you go to page 220 to 227 in your textbook, it will go over some of the key points from the lesson. Then what I want you to do is I want you to work on the worksheet, which is also titled Changes in Aggregate Demand, Aggregate Supply. Work on that for a while, uh, and when you come back next day, I'll have a little bit of a video posted where I'll talk about the answers and we can go over those a little bit together as a group. Okay, thank you.